Acts chapter number 1 will be our text for tonight. Acts chapter number 1. Most of you are familiar with this passage of Scripture. This is obviously the ascension of Jesus Christ here in Acts chapter number 1. We have a great verse in verse number 3. It says here that he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus Christ is with his disciples. These are his farewell words. And he tells them in verse number four that they need to wait for the promise of the Father. Verse number five, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in, all, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Do you know where you descend from? Do you know your lineage or your ancestry? It's kind of a novel thing today for people to trace their lineage, to try to get a sense of belonging, to try to find out their heritage and ancestry, to maybe kind of fill in the blank of some missing parts in their history. I think it has to do with an identity crisis that many people find themselves in because they want to understand a little bit more about maybe why they do certain things or they want to, like I said, have a sense of belonging to something or some group greater than they are. Oftentimes you'll see kids and children and you'll see in them their parents. You'll say, so and so, they're a spitting image of their dad or they're a spitting image of their mother. They're doing the same kind of things, little quirky things, or just their traits and their, their ways, their mannerisms, oftentimes are real similar to their parents. And so I think this idea of finding our ancestry or history as people go, I think that it is deep rooted in the problem that we have of identity. And unsaved people have a huge identity crisis because they can't trace their lineage back to God. But as Christians, our heritage goes back to Jesus Christ. Now, as far as a church goes, Acts chapter number 1 shows us Jesus with his disciples before the ascension, and he gives them some last farewell instructions, and his resurrection here sparks a revival. And I want us to look at the book of Acts here just in view of the resurrection and the revival that that spark of Jesus Christ rising from the dead started because our roots and our lineage and our history goes back to the book of Acts. And I want to say as Christians we have lost our roots. There are many Christians that have no idea anything about church history. They don't understand the progression of things that took place when you get past the first and second and third and fourth centuries. They don't understand the persecution that the church went through during the period of the Dark Ages. Oftentimes Christians are ignorant of some of the persecution even in early America, colonial times before 1776, where our Baptist forefathers were even persecuted for their faith. And so I think we lose our roots. We lose a sense of belonging and understanding of where we came from as a church and as an individual people. I mean, because really church history is not just about the Lord, although we focus on Jesus Christ. Church history is about people and about the church. And so I think we lose a sense of what are we supposed to be doing? What type of movement should we be manifesting as the church and what is behind that? I want to submit to you tonight that there's a revival spark that started the fire of the early first century church. And we see that here in the book of Acts. He said, you are going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses. And so Paul made it real clear to the Thessalonians that they became followers of them. He said, you became followers of us and of the Lord. And that thing has passed down 
from century to century. Now, I do want to say this by way of introduction. I am not advocating that we try to replicate everything that you find in the early first century church in the book of Acts. The church that you see in the book of Acts is what you would call a church in the apostolic time. Now, I will say this. Dispensationally, the church that you find in the book of Acts is in the body of Christ. In other words, that is the New Testament Christian dispensation during the period that we oftentimes refer to as the age of grace. You say, how can you say that when they didn't fully understand all the doctrines? I'm sure some of you listening don't fully understand all the doctrine either, but you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you're trusting Him. Now what you will find in the early part of Acts, although there is a progression of truth being revealed to the apostles, one thing that's constant, you're going to find that believers are just that. They are believers. They have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They might not fully understand the atonement. They might not fully understand the substitutionary part of that atonement, that Jesus had to die for them, for them to be able to have imputed righteousness by grace through faith without works. All of that wasn't ironed out until a little bit later on. We know in Acts chapter 15, Peter makes a declaration at the Council of Jerusalem. He says, we believe that we, speaking as Jews, shall be saved even as they, those Gentiles. They were saved by faith, without baptism. And so we understand some of those particulars. And here's also something I want to give by way of a prerequisite comment. We are not, and I'm not advocating, that we are to replicate the signs, wonders, and miracles that are part of the sign gifts. There are spiritual gifts that are still applicable for the church. Obviously, the gift of wisdom, I think, is one. The discerning of spirits. And I think charity and those types of things. But when you begin to look at the breakdown of signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus gave to his apostles during his earthly ministry, which was under a different gospel, the gospel of the kingdom gospel, which is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven, not the gospel of the grace of God, what you see is a difference and a distinction between the first century church the age of the apostles, and then all the other churches after that. You will not find signs, wonders, and miracles to the par and to the level that you see in the first century church. Because when they have the power of healing, people really get healed. What I'm referring to is somebody has a bone and it's broke. Here's the bone, it's sticking out. What are you going to do? Oh, we're going to go to a doctor. No, if you have the gift of healing, you put your hands on it, the bone goes back in the arm, the person's healed. Here's somebody and they're dead. What are you going to do? Call the uh, ambulance, call the morgue, call the, uh, the uh, examiner. No, you are going to lay hands on the dead. You're going to pray over the dead and the dead's going to get up. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Speaking in unknown languages. Tongues in the Bible is never unknown gibberish. You say, well, it's an unknown tongue. It's not known. Yeah, it's not known, but a tongue is always a language. You say, well, it's just a heavenly language. Anytime anyone speaks out of heaven directly in the scriptures, they're speaking Hebrew. So this glossiolia that you see in these churches is not real languages. It is gibberish, and that is not New Testament tongues that you see in the first century. Signs, wonders, and miracles. They had the power to do these things in the apostolic church. So I'm not advocating that we return back or try to restore that and say, we are the church of Acts, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do Corona be gonna. You know, come here and poof, I'm going to blow on you, and Corona be gonna, and we're going to do all this kind of crazy foolishness and, and all this kind of stuff that you see going on today. What I am saying, though, is this. There are principles that are so clear and so pertinent for us today, we would do well to take heed to those principles because they come off the spark, they come off the flame, if you will, of a revival that comes directly in proportion to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I mean, here are men willing to risk their lives preaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ knowing that they can be arrested, they can be locked up, they can be thrown in jail, and they can be killed, and all of those things happen to the early church. 
We have in Acts chapter 7, the first martyr, Stephen. Acts chapter 12, James, the brother of John, is killed. And Peter also is locked up in prison in Acts chapter number 12. He's in jail. And we see that all throughout the book of Acts. They're willing because there's a spark, there's a fire, there's something inside of them that keeps them going. And that's what we need. Now, the early church had this fire lit from the resurrection. I'll give you a sampling of these verses about them witnessing and speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is important. The resurrection of Christ is foundational. I know a lot of churches are preaching all these other things. I know they're coming in and they're having classes on how to lose weight and they're having classes on how to get your finances together and they're having all these sporting events on Wednesday night and all these activities to keep everybody coming in. But the gospel message is centered on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was dead and he's alive and you have a problem. It's called death and it's called hell and if you don't get saved, you're going to go to hell. And even if you do get saved, you're still going to die. So we have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to focus on that. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, that hope is centered around a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, a person, a man that rose again from the dead after being dead for three days and three nights. Here's the verses, Acts 1. The Bible says, beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Acts chapter 3, Peter's preaching. He says, you killed the prince of life whom God raised from the dead. In chapter 3 again, in verse number 26, unto you first, God having raised up his son Jesus. Chapter 4, verse number 2, the Pharisees were all uh, filled with envy and filled with hatred because the Bible says, Acts 4, verse number 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Verse number 10 of chapter 4, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you whole. Verse number 33 of Acts chapter 4, With great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 5, verse number 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Acts chapter 10, verse 40. Paul, uh, Peter preaching to Cornelius. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. Acts chapter 13, Paul preaching. But God raised him from the dead. The same thing, verse number 33. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again. Acts chapter 17. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You see, Jesus Christ being raised implies, like I preached earlier, that we are going to be raised. Jesus Christ came up before the judgment. Jesus Christ is sinless. He comes up. He doesn't have to be judged. Therefore, we can come up before the great and notable day of the Lord, before that great judgment comes. Acts chapter 23, when Paul perceived the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And then in Acts chapter 24, verse 15, he said this, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. The fire that sparked the first century revival was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what they were preaching. There's hope in death. There's hope in suffering, and it centers on the resurrection. And by the way, let me just give this little plug. You had great revival in the apostolic age, not because of great politicians and great political policy. You had great revival not because you had a great republic or a great democracy. You had a great revival because you had a great God, and you had people that were willing to let that fire of revival be lit and preach the truth. We have a mandate to preach. And I just want to give you three things, basically, maybe four, but three things about this resurrection revival. And I want to talk about their preaching first. Notice in Acts 1 verse number 9, he said, verse number 8, you shall receive power 
After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me. There's preaching. Now here in Acts chapter 1, verse number, verses 8 and 9, he talks about being witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You can see the, the uh, digression there, or the, I should say the expansion of the passage. You have starting in Jerusalem, that's the city. Judea, there's like the county. And then you go into Samaria, that's the outlying areas. And then the uttermost parts of the earth. So it starts at home. And it starts in your family. It starts in your community. It starts with the circle that you are around. It starts with the people you work with. It starts with your friends and your acquaintances. And then it begins to get a little more public. And then it begins to spread from the city, from the county, to the state, to the country, to the entire world. So why do you support foreign missions? It's the right thing to do. It's the spark of revival. You don't just try to win people right here where we are. We try to support people that are trying to win people to Christ in other lands. And so we have power to preach. Notice there's preaching to sinners. And then there's preaching to saints. In Acts chapter number 11, the Bible says they came to Antioch and they spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. They're preaching to sinners. We are called as saints to preach to sinners, not to put ourselves up here and say, I'm a saint, I'm better than you. No, we're sinners saved by grace, but we have the truth. And someone who doesn't have the truth, they have a great void, they have an emptiness, they have maybe ignorance, they need the facts so they can put faith in those facts and hopefully have a feeling, hopefully have a have an experience with God. Meet God and understand about Jesus Christ. And so they're preaching to sinners. How do they do this? They had power. Now we're not going to get into the whole tongues thing in Acts chapter number 2. I gave you just a little bit of that earlier. But I do want to talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Obviously being empowered. People make distinctions and I believe you could probably take verses and make some distinctions about an empowered to do a particular type of ministry as opposed to an empowering to live a daily victorious life or whatever, you can break down these things. Obviously, Paul said God enabled him. He counted him faithful. He enabled him, putting him into the ministry. God can enable you into a certain area. He can give you the power to perform a certain duty or task or calling. But I want us just to think about this. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, Be ye filled with the Spirit. That's a command. It's not an option. It's a command. And it's not something we are to pray for, although I don't think it's unbiblical to ask God to fill you because that's showing a willingness on your part to be filled. However, you need to understand this. The Bible teaches us in this age, not in Old Testament times and not in future tribulation times after the rapture of the church, but in this age there is a sealing of the Holy Spirit that happens the very moment a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13, Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 30. He says in Ephesians 1 13, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. He says over in 2 Corinthians 1, the Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance. It's like the down payment. God gave us the Holy Spirit. You can't get any more of God than you have. However, God can get more of you than He has. This has to do with our practical discipleship. This has to do with our willingness to be used. You can be a vessel either unto honor or unto dishonor. There are some people that are saved that aren't living Christian lives. We use the term Christian oftentimes very loosely, not very biblically. And I understand that you've got to deal with people where they are, and I can't go and change the terminology of the, of the age. I understand people use the, the term Christian very loose. But biblically, a Christian is a disciple. You can be saved and not be a disciple. You can get backslid on God and people look at your life and say, there's an unsaved heathen. You can do that. There's a difference in salvation and discipleship. But as a Christian disciple, you are to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He says, be not drunk 
with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Now, how do you get filled? Well, what does it mean, first of all? I was kind of covering that. It doesn't mean to be filled with the Spirit does not mean that you speak with gibberish. Okay? It doesn't mean you fall on the floor. It doesn't mean you come to church and you stand up and start talking or stand up and get the limelight where everybody gets their attention and focus off of the message and now they start looking at you acting like a fool or during a song service you start flopping around on the ground like a dog or something and getting all the attention on you. That's not what it means at all. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? I believe it means to be controlled. It means nothing else is there but the Spirit. If you take a glass and you empty it out of, let's say, Coca-Cola, and then you fill it up with water, it's filled with water. Now, if you take that glass and it's filled with Coca-Cola, and you begin pouring water in it, and you keep pouring the water in it, eventually all the Coke is going to go out, and it's going to be filled with water. And similarly, you can also take it, and you can just fill it up a little bit, and it not be completely filled and so the idea is to be completely filled with the Spirit, to be controlled by the Spirit instead of being controlled by the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, he says in Galatians 5, and be not... Um, let me give you the verse, Galatians chapter number 5. If you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. It's on the tip of my tongue here. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the idea is to be controlled by the Spirit. So he gives us this analogy, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, I believe is by way of contrast for us to learn something from this. So, so how do you get filled with the Spirit? You repent from the works of the flesh. And then number two, you relent to the leading of the Spirit of God. Here's a comparison. You're going to have to hit the bottle in order to become intoxicated. Someone that gets drunk with wine, they have to hit the bottle. If you're going to be filled with the Spirit of God, you have got to go and get in the Word of God because this is where the Spirit of God comes from. You say, well, I have the Spirit of God on the inside. Okay, well, you fellowship with God, but you're going to have to get in this right here. You're going to have to hit the bottle. When someone is intoxicated, they act out of character. Sometimes, if they're real shy, they may become very bold. Sometimes if they're real shy, they may be overly friendly. Sometimes if they're normally friendly, they might be mean. They might be rude. They might be very, oftentimes they are very talkative. They just run their mouth and they talk and talk and talk. And oftentimes they're very generous when they're intoxicated. These are traits, I believe, by contrast, he gives this. Here's someone that they're walking around, and that's why they use the term, you'll see it, it'll say spirits for sale. One good thing about this calamity we're in, of course, I don't think they closed the liquor store. How is that unnecessary? That's not a grocery store. You don't have to have that. You say, well, it's my medicine. No, you can get medicine now. You don't have to do like Timothy, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. That's no excuse to get drunk and to be filled with this garbage. It's another spirit. It's demonic. He says, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it moveth itself. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, the Bible says. It's a command. However, there are great characteristics in contrast. They act out of character. It affects how you walk. Someone that's intoxicated, it affects their walk. And after a while, it will wear off unless they go back to the bottle to get filled. You know, as a Christian, you can be on fire for God. You can be filled with God. You can want to preach to sinners. You can want to preach to the saints. You can want to fellowship. You can have all this. You can be so overjoyed and so filled, and then it's like you start leaking. You ever get a leak? Amen. You ever spring a leak? Man, there's a lot of Christians that spring a leak. Some of you, you've been springing some leaks for a long time. Might I say some of you that hadn't been coming to church anyway, you don't even realize nothing's going on that's different. You hadn't been here in a long time anyway. Your leak, man, your holes done got so big, you're going to have to get a bunch of Bondo and patch up the bottom of the boat, man. It is bad. Well, you don't want to leak. 
you want to patch up those holes and you want to feed yourself and uh, pour in the Word of God. Preaching to sinners. There are several examples of this. I'll give you two. Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch is coming back and Philip goes and he says, Understandest thou what thou readest? The eunuch had been up there and he's reading the Isaiah scroll, Isaiah 53. Understandest what thou readest? He says, How can I except some man should guide me? Philip began to take that portion of Scripture. The Bible says that the same Scripture he began and preached unto him Jesus. He preaches to a sinner, an individual. In Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in jail and they're praising God and they're preaching and, and everything happens and all of a sudden there's an earthquake. The jailer comes in there and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Preaching to individual sinners. You know, you can preach and not have to be a preacher. I'm not talking about the office of pastor or the office of a uh, deacon or a missionary. Everybody, as, a, as far as a Christian is concerned, can be a witness. You can all be a witness. There's someone, some, somebody somewhere that needs you to be a witness to them about God and about His grace and about His goodness and about Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. And we need to make sure we push the point. And that's the problem. A lot of times people don't push the point. Billy Sunday said this, many churches report no new members or confessions of faith. He says, why do you have these results? Billy Sunday, by the way, before Billy Graham, Billy Sunday was the greatest revivalist preacher as far as preaching to more crowds ever. And of course, this is back before the technological age with the uh, television satellites and radios and amplifiers and all those kind of things. But he was fairly modern in modern day. But Billy Sunday made some statements about this. Why are there so few coming into the kingdom of God, he said. He said, I will tell you, there is not a definite effort put forth to persuade a definite person to receive a definite Savior at a definite time. You have to be persuasive. You have to say, hey... I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose again from the dead. He will save you from hell if you will call. Have you asked him to be your savior? Have you ever been saved? Now, you don't have to be so blunt right off the bat, but be a witness. Be a testimony. Say, hey, do you believe in God? What's your testimony? What's your religious background? Let me just ask you a question. If you were to die today, would you be in heaven or hell? Well, I never thought about that before. Well, according to the Bible, we're all guilty of sin. Would you admit that, you know, you've messed up, you've sinned? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. He came down here and lived a sinless life, and he died on the cross to pay the penalty that you and I can't pay, and he rose again from the dead, and he offers eternal life if you'll trust him as your personal Savior. You do not have to die and go to hell. You can go to heaven when you die. It's as simple as that. Preaching to sinners and also preaching to saints. They had power. There's a spark that Jesus Christ rising from the dead lit. And it lit this flame. It began to spread. They preached to saints. Acts chapter 15. The Bible says Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch teaching and preaching the word of the Lord. That's what we're supposed to do. We are here, and you're watching. Uh, we can't assemble at the moment, but we come together, not like I said, for some type of uh, a financial class or some weight loss class or have some gym so we can have some kind of sports activity or, or some kind of things so we can tutor people in their classes and everybody can sit down and have this little program and that program. We are here to preach and to teach the Bible. There is a spiritual education that should take place in church. We call it Sunday school. We teach through the Bible verse by verse. Our Sunday school teachers prepare their lessons. They spend time in education. The Sunday school hour is different than preaching hour. Sunday school is different. We expect you to have your Bible. We expect you to actually know the books of the Bible and be able to turn in it and learn. And we will expound and exposit on the Bible. Preaching and teaching to saints. We are to encourage each other. He told Timothy, he said, you need to preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. We encourage each other by preaching. Acts chapter number 20, the Bible says Paul was preaching there. 
And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eunicus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. Paul had to be a Baptist preacher because he was so long-winded. The last verse in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 28 verse 31, starts with the word preaching. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things. Power to preach. That's not all. Acts chapter number 4. Acts chapter number 4, we see that the early church had hearts to give. They had hearts to give. There was something about them. I know the uh, demographics are different here in the book of Acts, and I understand that in the first century church, there was a little different thing socially going on, especially when you consider what was taking place in the Roman Empire, what was taking place in Judea, as far as the persecution of the early church. And so they had this socialistic type of thing going on. You'll see, see it here in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 37. The Bible says, The multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. That's where that word communism comes from. And no, I'm not advocating communism today. Don't misunderstand me. Verse 33, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Boy, we needed a little revival of that. Let me just park here for a second. Some of you need to have grace with each other. You need to realize this person over here is my brother or sister in Christ or this person over here is my brother or sister in Christ and I'm going to choose to love them. I'm going to choose to forgive. They might have been rude to me, but I'm not going to go run my mouth about everybody, run my mouth about how they did such and such and find these little peculiar things to pick somebody apart with. I'm just going to have some grace because God knows if God didn't have grace with me, where would I be? How in the world should I be treating my brothers and sisters in Christ because of God's mercy and God's love and God's long-suffering? Hasn't God been patient with you? Hasn't God been long-suffering with you? How come you can't put up with your brother or sister in Christ? I know we're all a little quirky and we're all a little weird and sometimes we get on each other's nerves. I know I get on your nerves and I know some of you get on my nerves. But we have to love one another. Just get over it. Grow up a little bit. Pull your big boy britches on or your big girl britches on and let's have some grace and let's get along. It's a sad day in Bible-believing churches when we have the Bible right and we can't have our fellowship with one another right. The early church, man, they had revival. How do you know when you got revival in a church? Everybody's getting along. You're going to have revival when people are fighting and spatting and talking about one another. Amen and amen. Great grace was upon them all. Notice verse 34, Acts chapter 4. Neither was there any of them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, brought the prices of the things that were sold, laid them down at the apostles' feet. Now, you see this also in chapter number 2, also in chapter number 5, verse number 4. Well, in chapter 5, you see it with Ananias and Sapphira. But this is, this is all I want to say, and I'll move on, and we'll wrap it up. They had hearts to give. There's a willful and cheerful giving going on. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. They were willingly giving, and they were cheerfully giving and they were giving according to their ability. In Acts chapter number 11, they had a famine in the land, and the Jerusalem saints had a need. And the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 11, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. They were willing to give. They were willing to support the work of the ministry and to give to the ministry of the saints. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, Paul said, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12, If there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Are you willing to give? Okay, now purpose and give willingly according to your ability. Don't go write a check that's going to bounce. Don't write a rubber check. 
Don't try to give so much above your bounds you can't do what you're supposed to do with your family. But be able to give cheerfully and willingly and according to the ability that God's blessed you. Some of you, maybe you don't have the funds to be able to do what somebody else. God's not going to judge you according to them. God's going to hold them accountable. They're going out and they're getting all these boats and all these cars and all these payments and all this kind of stuff. And now they're so far behind they can't put $5 into play. They're going to give account for just wasting all their stuff on them. Let them deal with it. You're going to give account what you give. And so don't let this thing become a race and some type of competition. The thing, the idea is to have a heart that is on fire for God, so much so it's willing to give because it's better to give than to receive. You always feel better when you give and you help someone rather than just hoarding it and trying to keep it all for yourself. Here you are walking through the store and you already have plenty of TP, but you're going to get more just so you can say you got more. I'm just being funny. Okay, we'll stop with the TP references there. 1 Peter 4, verse number 9, he says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Be hospitable. Be, be a friend. Be kind. Hearts to give and then songs to sing. Acts chapter 5, they came back rejoicing, the Bible says, that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They were excited that they were being persecuted for Christ. Because they knew he was alive. That just verified, hey, if it's not true, why is everybody getting so mad? If the Bible's not true, why do you want to burn it? Why do you get so upset with God? These atheists, you know, they speak about God just like he's real. It's funny. They'll get to talking about it and they'll say God this and God that. And we, I thought you said you didn't believe in God. Why don't you say the supposed being, the supposed deity? Because he is alive and he is real and we do have the truth. And so if you get persecution because of the truth, don't be amazed at the fiery trial that is the trial, you Peter says. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice, he says. Singing and rejoicing go hand in hand. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, he says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, Colossians chapter 3. Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in jail. I made reference to it earlier. They're locked up in jail in that dirty dungeon. The Bible says they sang, or at midnight, they prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. We should glory instead of gripe. We should worship instead of worry. We should praise instead of protest. And we should sing instead of sob. You know, the Lord will put you through a fiery trial sometimes just to get the sweeter song out of you. And sometimes you can only sing with tears when you're going through the fire. The lodgepole pine, it drops its cones, but those cones never break open so the seed can come out until there's intense heat, and that takes a forest fire to release that intense heat in order to release the much-needed seed to multiply and to be fruitful. You're going to be fruitful in your Christian life? It's going to take a fire. It's going to take a trial. It's going to take some trouble. It's going to take a test to squeeze it out of you and to sing like you've never sung before. I'll never forget a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. His daughter passed away. And I watched him and his wife as I was on the podium getting ready to do the service there, and we sang the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And I watched them sing that song with tears in their eyes, meaning and believing every word of it. It is well, it is well with my soul. Boy, you can't sing with a tear in your eye and with a, a, a meaning in your heart until you go through those trying times. But that shows you the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Well, revival sparked by the resurrection continued everywhere it spread. You know the rest of the story, I hope. Christianity did not get put out. It did not get extinguished. Missions is another thing I would have dealt with if we had more time, but in Acts chapter 13, the church commissions missionaries. You see a personal calling in Acts 16 when Paul has a vision from a man in Macedonia that says, Come and help us. And the resurrected Christ 
is the one who sustained the Apostle Paul to do what he did through the trials and troubles and temptations and tribulation that he had. I want to encourage you to go back to our roots. Go back to the book of Acts next time you read through it. Don't try to replicate some of those miracles. You're not going to have the ability to go to the graveyard and pull somebody up from the ground. The signs, wonders, and miracles have ceased with the rejection of the gospel by the Jewish people. We understand that. We understand that dispensationally. But don't just dismiss the book of Acts because there are great principles of revival fire that we all need. And it all got sparked and started by them being a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus Christ is alive. He's real. And He has commissioned us to be a witness of that resurrection. And we can be a testimony. And we can have revival, at least in our own lives, maybe in our own families, maybe in our own church. And we can be a testimony in our community of what Jesus Christ has done personally in our life. I know Jesus Christ is alive, not just because I have the Bible that tells me. I'm glad I do. But I know He's alive because He's inside of me. And He lives in my heart. Father, thank You for the Scriptures. Thank You for the great testimony of the early church. God, I pray that all of us would take heed. And maybe, Lord, try to go back to our roots to find our identity. We need to be preaching and proclaiming and testifying of the gospel, the grace of God. Lord, help us to have a song in our heart, to have a heart that's willing to give and willing to be poured out. God, I thank you, Lord, for the testimony of Christians all through the ages. Lord, we have a goodly heritage. Lord, we have a lot to live up to. Lord, help us to proudly, in the right type of sense, name the name of Christ. Lord, help us to have a spirit of revival because of your resurrection. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.